design, how you came to be there, sort right. of name, rank and unit really. Um, you want me to start now? Yes, please. Right, well my name is Reginald Baker. I'm 85 years old. I joined the army January the 4th, 1945. I was called up in 1945. And the war was still on then. Although by the time I finished my training, the war was over. And uh, after treading water in the country, I was eventually sent abroad early in 1946 to Egypt, where um, I was in the transit camp at Tel El Kabir, which is a, tra a, a, a cantonment, an army cantonment, which is in effect a small town consisting of lots of units. So there would be several thousand soldiers there, and in fact there were quite a lot of German Africa Corps prisoners of war there while I was there. After I'd been there about a week or so, I was uh, posted to Palestine and put on the train and um, we went over the Sinai Desert and arrived at Palestine. When, you, when the army sends you anywhere, you always arrive in the middle of the night. They have a special um, committee to, start to decide that, to make sure that you never get there at a convenient time, you see. Anyway, that's only neither here nor there. And I was posted to a unit, a, a Royal Army Ordnance Corps unit, which consisted of a laundry and uh, stores and all the, the Royal Army. Uh, I wasn't an RAOC uh, ordinary person, we were drivers, you see, drivers IC as they call drivers internal combustion. And you were a separate lot, but you get posted to wherever they wanted you to go and drive. There were about three or four drivers in the unit. And uh, after a spell in um, Tilletwinski cantonment, we were posted to a very small camp a few miles from Petatikva. Um, a small camp, it was it, it housed American soldiers during the war by all accounts and there were only about 40 or 50 of us in the camp and we weren't there for any particular reason except to guard the railway station which was next door to it, Ras Elaine. And the main line ran almost through the camp and uh, the, the station was there and, and I should get back to that because there's some significance there. Anyway, it was uh, um, nothing much happened. We'd heard um, the stories of the illegal immigrants being intercepted by British warships and uh, taken to Cyprus and there was a, a, a stories of some punch-ups that went on on board between the, the soldiers and the, the, the immigrants but we never paid much attention to it and um, we had a fairly quiet life. Uh, plus we loved it, the food was brilliant. We had lovely food and lots of things that we hadn't seen in England for years. Grapes, oranges, bananas and uh, sweets galore and beautiful ice cream that we never had during the war because ice cream during the war like everything else was uh, utility. Anyway, um, after a while the, the illegal immigrant importation uh, uh, got a bit worse, you see, and the, the, they, the, the Jew, the, the Hagenar and the Ergen, Ergen is by Lumi, they began to um, create diversions in order to get uh, the, these immigrants ashore. And the worst, the very, the very first bad incident occurred in Tel Aviv where the 6th Airborne Division, who were in Palestine at the time, had a car park where their Liberty trucks used to park. A Liberty truck is what takes the soldiers into town for uh, reasons of recreation and so on. And they had these Liberty trucks in the car park and they had a guard tent with six men and an NCO. And Ergen, in order to create a diversion, they threw a hand grenade over the wire to kill the sentry and then rushed in the door into the tent and shot the other six men dead, six paratroopers, my NCO. Well, there was a, in the meantime, they smuggled ashore further up the coast near Haifa, a load of immigrants who had been smuggled in. Well, the following night, the six airborne returned to Tel Aviv in force and they wrecked the place. They turned up and uh, they went through the place like a tornado. They broke windows, 
was turned cars over. Anybody who got in the way was beaten up. And it was a pretty scary situation, although we weren't involved in it, of course. The, 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 I don't think that the uh, airborne officers were too keen on uh, noticing it for a while, you know. And uh, there was a hell of a row about it. The Jewish press began to um, complain, but then they always did receive. But it passed off. But from then on, it got worse. And that was just the start. The airborne had declared war on the Jewish population, and the uh, and the consequences of that uh, became pretty awful later on when uh, a certain incidents occurred. And uh, then the trouble started in earnest. They were they started drive-by shootings at British soldiers and policemen. Roadside bombings, where they had these trembler bombs, which would go off when a military vehicle passed. And anybody who survived the blast was killed or shot. And uh, it was, and, it, and then of course this went on until July 1946, when the King David Hotel, which is a very big building in Jerusalem, was bombed. Uh, it's an oblong building, and they put the bomb at one end underneath in the basement under which under the uh, eating area the restaurant and so on it was a very powerful bomb and when it went off it just blew away the section of the um, King David Hotel causing the whole of it to collapse on top of the people inside and there were 91 people killed Jews, Arabs and British in fact there were more Jews and Arabs killed than there were British and uh, there were people on outside, and the bomb was so powerful that it killed people outside. And one unfortunate man, who I later, many years later, discovered, was the postmaster of Jerusalem. He was blown across the road. His body was blown across the road. And opposite the King David Hotel was this YMCA building, which was painted pure white. And he was imprinted upon that. And it took months to get rid of it. And uh, they, it took them days to dig out. The, I mean, there's just a great big pile of rubbish with all these bodies underneath, and it was July, the temperature was in the 90s, and the smell of it became quite oppressive. I, I came in, I was a dispatch rider, a motorcyclist, so I used to go out quite a bit, every day in fact, and uh, I drove into, rode into Jerusalem a couple of days later, and I could smell when I was two miles away, and that's what was happening, and by the time we got there, it was quite overpowering. There was no new and dead people under that day in 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and um, they decomposed fairly quickly in those conditions. Well, that um, I think the authorities then didn't know what to do. You know, you can't take reprisals because you don't know who did it. The whole point about these terrorists is that they don't wear uniforms, they don't come and fight you the way that the Germans used to or the Italians. They come out and uh, sneak up on you, and they did that very good indeed, very well indeed. And so it went on like that. They they carried on. They blew up um, government buildings. They fired at uh, army vehicles from the from uh, the orange groves, of which there were quite a few in that part in that part of Palestine. And uh, it got worse and worse, and eventually we weren't allowed to go into any Jewish towns at all. The soldiers, but we were virtually confined to barracks, you see. So, because uh, not only did they want to protect the soldiers, but they wanted to protect the Jewish civilians from what the soldiers might do to them, you see, because feelings were then getting pretty high. And you can imagine uh, and, and, uh, people were taking revenge where they could, and, uh, and there was a lot of Legal shooting going on, you know, by the army as well as the uh, as well as the Jews, and uh, we were warned to be on our guard against uh, uh, when we were out driving. You see, although I used to go out every day on a motorcycle all on my own, I don't know why. When looking back on it, I thought it was, <laughs> but I was invited to leave the motorcycle if I felt nervous. But being 19 years old and immortal, you see, I didn't. Uh, in fact, I rather enjoyed the freedom that I had. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, I did endure in Tel Aviv, particularly, which is a Jewish town, certain demonstrations of hostility, of being spat upon by children, having fists shaken at me, insults hurled at me, and uh, 
all of which I managed to survive. And then on one occasion, I was up, not in Tel Aviv, this time, outside on the road, but heading back towards camp, and there was a, a lorry load of Jewish workmen in front of me, three tons of them they were in the back, and they were all shaking their fists at me, you see, and hurling insults at me. And one of them came from the back of the road with a great big lump of wood, a huge piece of wood, and he hurled it at me, and you see. <coughs> so it didn't cause me any bounce around and I avoided it quite simply, and I dropped it back, and I thought, well, <coughs> I'm not going to get involved with this, so I'm turning off soon to go home. And they carried on insulting me in there. And that was the atmosphere, you see, I'm just mm -hmm. trying to convey to you. And that was not just me, that was anybody else who was out. Um, 